2024 fur tutorial highly anticipated video i'll be showing you how to make a home style fur recipe that rivals the most famous fur broth in australia from fur Anne in bankstown sydney my hometown it's my all-time favorite fur broth and it's one i've looked up to my entire life there is something so special about this broth no one knows what goes into it and i've heard all the rumors growing up as a kid like the one where the owners were supposedly putting in crack yes although never proven word on the street they're putting in some extras to get the customers hooked although wild these are very well known stories in the vietnamese community I've even heard the one where it calls you in your sleep. My uncle told me this one. He had a friend who had for Anne. Bro went to bed, woke up 3 a.m. and like something out of the exorcist, he woke up screaming. Fun. He had a craving for it. That's how addictive this broth is. And it's where I coined the phrase X Factor. It's where a broth has something so unique, something so peculiar about the taste, you can't quite put your finger on it. But in my other hand is my home style fur recipe. I made it twice, once at the store, a second time in my home studio. When I finish, I decided to put them head to head on my bricks meter. My broth edged out the fur and by the slightest of margins in the bricks reading. So, backed by science, I can confidently say this home style fur recipe rivals, if not beats the most famous fur broth in Australia. But that's not the crazy part. It took me less than 15 minutes to make this using the blend method. I'm going to show you exactly how I did it from the 1 to 1 24 hour bone broth base you can make in your sleep through to the secret seasoning ratio you need to put into your pot to unlock its full potential. All right guys, to set the expectation for this video, it's a long one and I make no apologies. The way it's gonna work, we've got some theory to cover first before we hit the practical. And yes, I know theory's boring, but it's essential. Because I'm going to explain why you've never been able to pull off a batch of fur in the past you were happy with. I'm going to explain it using science and numbers. So for the newbies, I highly recommend you watch the entire video. It's going to help you immensely. But for the seasoned veterans out there, feel free to skip ahead at any time. Chapters are timestamped below. Also, pinned in the top comment will be a bunch of useful links, including the downloadable recipe, which you can follow along as you make this. Again, it's a long one, but if you make it through to the end, you'll be rewarded with a recipe that actually works. Surprise, surprise. You know, I still get emails, comments, videos, photos from people like yourselves who using this recipe went on to cook their best batch ever and were then able to proudly share it with their friends and loved ones. You see, this isn't new. It's based off an old recipe that I shot two years ago, my restaurant quality file video at home. Now, most recently, I had Luke, a fellow subscriber on the channel. It was one of the first to try my updated seasoning ratio, and he nailed this recipe on his first attempt. Like, he was so happy with the taste. He drove it kindly two hours from the Sunshine Coast for me to verify the taste. I'm limited with what I've got. I'm not set up like a kitchen. So I only have this the Kmart pot and a slow cooker from Big W. Yeah, that is... Yeah, it's good. It's, it's intense. I was blown away. It was so accurate that I ended up using his broth, sold it to customers that night who smashed it. Last but not least, a special thank you to my bro, Jason Farmer. It's a good chance you've seen one of his viral videos here on YouTube. He did a file recipe video, which I was so humbled to be featured in. So it's brought this tiny channel of mine so much growth, so much exposure. So thank you, brother. And for all the people over from Jason's channel, a very, very warm welcome. I owe you two beers when I get to Texas, brother. Hello, welcome. My name's Leighton. I'm a professional chef from Brisbane, Australia. 
I've got the best job in the world. I run a brothel called FQ. It's got double meanings. I sell broths and high-end Vietnamese soups. I've been doing this for over 13 years. And next door, my family and I run the busiest Vietnamese establishment in Brisbane. Now, before we hit the practical side, I know a lot of people are eager to get straight into the cooking. They're not interested in my stories. We ain't too interested in your good old Mississippi boy stories, Anderson. You ain't from here no more. But this next one will really help frame up the struggle that I had. And it's very important that I tell you this story because many of you too are going through the exact same thing, trying to navigate this dish we call pho. As the story goes, Pho and were my neighbors from across the street. You see, mum had a florist on Greenfield Parade and Pho and were mum's landlord. So, as you can imagine, from an early age, I got to taste the best. So, when I first started Pho Q many years ago, I had no idea how to cook Pho. And some of my first batches tasted like dog shit. Like the drain behind me has tasted more of my pho broth than customers out in the dining area. But the way I learned to cook pho, it was really strange. I'd have my pot, a sample of pho an, I'd taste mine, then theirs just to see how far off I was. And in the beginning, I was way, way off. And this is a real sample that I froze from like five years ago, just to give you an idea of the way I learned to cook pho by studying the best. And eventually, with a lot of practice, endless batches, you have no idea what I've been through, I close that gap. And I have a formulation today that I'm very happy with. And it's all thanks to for Anne. And looking back now, you'd need those brokey days to appreciate the juxtaposition today. So just very grateful to be where I am, about to teach you how to cook your best batch ever. Before we go any further, this is LSP latent seasoning powder. You need this for today's recipe. It will not work without it. It's non-negotiable. It's available in 200, 450 and 900 grams. But on the back of all the packets, there's the workflow for today's video, including the secret seasoning ratio and the amount of LSP I've sent out over the last few months has been astronomical. You have no idea, guys. I've sent orders to every single American state in America. Goose Creek, South Carolina, Haymarket, Virginia, Louisville, Kentucky, Cottage Grove, Minnesota, Paris, Texas, Arlington, New Jersey, Middletown, Connecticut, you name it, I've been there. Hawaii, a lot going over to Canada, and recently I had one go to Norway. It's been such an incredible journey because it started with one order, and now it's a major side hustle. So to everyone who's ordered, who have ordered and will order, thank you so much. I appreciate the support for the channel. You can find this on my online store. Link's going to be in the description below. So let's get straight into it. These are the settings for today's video because I've got shocking handwriting, taking the liberty of summarizing it onto this single piece of paper. So treat this like a roadmap. It's going to help you along the way. Download it first, read it through, get familiar with the concepts, including the recipe outline, where we are making a three liter batch of pho. Let's begin now with the three stages to cooking pho. Stage one, creating your base. Beef bones, water, heat, and time produces a base which is the foundation for this recipe. Stage two is adding in the seasoning, salt, sugar, LSP, fish sauce, add in everything else, the aromatics and the spices. You'd cook it, which transforms it into pho, leading to stage three, serving it. But within that, there are three stages of seasoning. Stage one, pre-seasoning. Stage two, final adjustment. And the final boss, adding in the X factor. Now, let's revisit the blend method. It just means preparing your base in advance. 
We all know the most time-consuming part, the most strenuous about creating a file is simmering the bones. So why don't we get it out of the way in advance? Have it there in your fridge or freezer and then on the day you want to cook for, take it out, blend it with the seasoning, the aromatics, the spices you can serve for very quickly. With the basics out of the way, the million dollar question, how do I unlock the maximum potential out of my thought? To find the answer, we first need to understand the relationship between bricks and salt percentage. To visualize this, I'm going to draw two circles on a piece of paper. The first circle stands for base, the second seasoning. Now how do I unlock the maximum gains out of my fault? It's simple. If your base and seasoning align, you've got a great tasting fault every single time. So what this means is, if you create a strong concentrated base, one to one over 24 hours, that's my recommendation, and you put in the correct seasoning ratio of salt, sugar, LSP, fish sauce, you've got a great tasting for every other day. So that is the fear behind it. There are two conditions you need to meet, the base and the seasoning, and that's all well and good on paper, but what does it look like in the real world? So to help you understand this next part, I'm gonna put some real world numbers behind them. So throughout this tutorial, I used a tool called a bricks meter. You may have seen this in my previous videos. It's a refractometer. And the way it works, you take a sample of liquid, you put it in the prism, you press a button, it gives you two results, a bricks value and a salt percentage. Bricks value, if you're unfamiliar, is the unit of measurement which measures the concentration of a liquid, how much is packed into it with water being a bricks value of zero, and it goes up from there. So everything that you see in your kitchen from soy sauce to fish sauce has a bricks value and a salt percentage. And if you took a reading from one bottle to the next, they should be identical. As a professional tool, this bricks meter helps me maintain consistency. It's made by a Japanese company called Otago. They do all kinds of measuring equipment for the food services industry. But according to their website, there's a direct relationship between concentration and salt content, which is the decisive factor in all foods. So basically what this means is, if the base and the seasoning align, you've got yourself a great tasting dish. In this case, a pho. Using this bricks meter, I took a reading of my 24 hour bone broth base at 15 hours and again at 24 hours. 5.1 at 15 hours, which rose to 7.0 at 24 hours. So you can see with time, the bricks value increases. So we know the base needs to be a bricks value of seven. That's the base condition out of the way. Let's tick that off. Moving over to the seasoning side, if you put in the following into your pot, that completes this side. The base and the seasoning align. By the end, you should have a full broth with a bricks value of 8.7 and a salt percentage of 1.51%. The reason why the bricks play such a critical role in this recipe is for the first time we have a standard to work with. Now let's take Coca-Cola for example, the greatest soft drink ever invented. No one knows exactly what the recipe is, but I can tell you this Coke can had a bricks value of 10.9. That's the full formulation. A watered down Coke from say your McDonald's drive through would have a lower bricks value. I took a reading of the legendary for Anne Broth, 8.3 bricks, 1.45% salt. Like the Coca-Cola example, I can't tell you exactly what for Anne put into the recipe, but it gives you a good idea of the numbers you need to hit if you wanted to replicate this broth. 
What I will say is these numbers confirm my long-held suspicion. This broth is special. There's so much flavor packed into it and head to head against my recipe, I edged out the fern broth by the smallest of margins. But my point here is to show you how important the relationship between the bricks and the salt percentage is and whether it's just a home style fur recipe or the most famous fur broth in Australia, the numbers matter. And theoretically, if 100 people on this channel made this recipe, all 100 bowls should taste identical since we're all singing off the same hymn sheet. Armed with all this knowledge, we're ready to hit the practical side. Let me show you how I did it. The prerequisite for the next chapter is to have your base with a bricks value of 7 ready to go. If you don't know how to make it, there's an extensive chapter towards the end on how to make this, which means I shot this video back to front. So feel free to skip ahead, watch that first, come back, watch the next chapter on the replay. Welcome to the second half. Let's get cooking. On the day you want to cook, for, take three liters of base prepared in advance out of your fridge or freezer. The base should have a bricks value of seven. And a simple way to know whether you've done it correctly or not is the jelly test. It's a simple test. It should be a solid block of jelly. If it's anything less, if it's runny or watery, something went wrong. Refer to the next chapter to troubleshoot. As you'll find out, when you create your base, it's going to release a fat layer on top. Save this beef fat, adding in a generous amount into your pot, low to medium heat. Next, add in your charred onion and ginger. I used half a brown onion, a couple pieces of ginger, which are grilled over charcoal two days in advance. And remember guys, you can do this well ahead of time. You don't have to do it on the day. Add it to your pot, shallow fry to activate. Next, add in the spices, the exact ratio that I used, 20 grams of star anise, 14 grams of cardamom, 12 grams of cinnamon, two grams of clove. And remembering it's entirely up to you. Everyone has their own preference when it comes to how much spice you put into a pho. The way I do it, very little spice, just enough to mask out that beefy smell from the bone broth base. I don't like my broth too floral. If it's your first time making this recipe, I'd recommend sticking close to these ratios. Then on the second time through, feel free to change it up. You may want to add in some extras like the coriander seed. But also remember, you're limited by the pre-pack spice packets that you find in Asian supermarkets. These are much cheaper to buy than the loose leaf commercial packets that I use. These usually come with a filter bag. So you may not want to shallow fry it like I do. You can roast it first in your oven, put it in the bag and add it to your broth. Next, add in the base, bring it to a gentle simmer. This takes us to the pre-seasoning stage where we add in the seasoning right at the beginning. If you watch my other tutorials, you know I refer to this as band practice. Most recipes tell you to season at the end. This is wrong. I like to put mine in at the beginning to let the ingredients get to know each other. In other words, jam. This brings us to the most important part of the video. How do I unlock the maximum potential out of my stock pot? Okay, this is where most people have a lot of trouble. And remember, what you've done up until this point, all that hard work simmering the bones means nothing if you can't pull off this next part. And the key to unlocking this recipe centers around the following seasoning ratio, which you'll find on the back of all the LSP packets. Salt, 35 grams or 1.17%. LSP, 20 grams or 0.67%. Rock sugar, 55 grams or 1.83%. Let the broth simmer for a few minutes to dissolve the rock sugar taste. If the base was done correctly, this is the moment 
it comes to life. It should take you very close to your final taste destination, about 95% correct. From here, to give you the short version, the process is a similar broth to infuse the aromatics and spices, which then takes you to the final adjustment stage where you make the final corrections to the broth with fish sauce. Add in the X Factor, serve. Now, instead of just adding in the secret seasoning ratio and winning the game, I want to show you an alternative way to season which I found really helped level up my seasoning game. I call this technique chasing depth. When I season any kind of soup, I always start off by adding in salt only. What I'm trying to do is touch this imaginary point called the taste floor. This is where you unlock the maximum taste in your broth. The way to get there, adding in salt. And for this recipe, we know it's 35 grams, but say you're making a recipe that doesn't have an established seasoning ratio. It's basically a guessing game where you try and add in enough salt so that the taste is on its limits. In other words, if you add any more salt, it will literally taste like salt water. And this is how you know you're close. The second reason I add in salt only is to isolate our sense of taste so that we really hone in on getting as close to that taste floor as possible. Our much mistake is to add in too many seasoning all at once. If you're new, you don't know how to season, there's just way too much noise and you'll end up confusing yourself. So the way I do it, salt only, get close to that taste floor. Once you're there, work your way back with the other seasonings. For today's recipe, go ahead, add in one tablespoon of salt taste. Most beginners will stop here believing it's salty enough, right? Wrong. Remember, we're aiming for close to 1.51% salt content and one tablespoon of salt just isn't enough. So go ahead, add in another three quarter tablespoons of salt or to bring the total value to 35 grams, taste again. And a word of warning, it's going to be very, very salty, very uncomfortable. And right now, you're most likely in your kitchen with a gob full of salty broth in your mouth thinking, the hell, Leighton. But trust me, this is exactly where we want to be in this salty region here. And I want you for a moment to ignore the salt. Put that aside and focus on the deep flavors of the broth coming through as you're tasting it. Now, a simple way to picture this entire process is trying to touch the deep end of a pool. Salt brings out flavor in food. If you add in the correct amount, you'll be rewarded with a great tasting dish. On the flip side, if you don't add in enough, you're barely ankle deep in the kiddies pool wondering why my food doesn't taste right. So always remember, seasoning is an exact science. You need to hit your numbers and the salt percentage is the decisive factor in all foods. Now that you've experienced sitting on the taste floor, go ahead, add in the rest of the seasoning. This brings the taste back into alignment. From here, simmer for 15 minutes, bringing us to the final adjustment stage. The final adjustment is the second last stage of seasoning where I add in fish sauce. The moment our broth is balanced, but it's lacking some depth. Remember, salt can only take you so far up the road. This is where the fish sauce takes over. And once you add it in, it gives the broth that extra umami hit. And literally, the broth goes up a level once you add this in. So the point of this exercise, we want to take the taste profile under. We want to add in enough so that it's in the salty region again. I added two to three teaspoons enough so that you can taste a slightly salty edge. In other words, you can taste the fishiness from the fish sauce. For the astute viewers, there's an important ingredient I missed, brisket. Ideally, if you're cooking far, you'd add the brisket into the broth and you'd cook it. I completely forgot about ordering it that day, which is why I made this video without 
the brisket just to show you how quickly you can turn a base into a pho but ideally if you're making this recipe i'd highly recommend you add in half a kilo of brisket you'd cook it in the fur broth for three hours which is the ideal cooking time for brisket and the ideal infusion time for the aromatics and the spices it deepens the flavor i wouldn't go any longer than three hours this is when the spices can turn bitter. So if you think of green tea at a Chinese restaurant that's been seeping too long in the pot. Now at the store, there've been times when I've cooked batches with and without the brisket. The ones without, there's a noticeable difference to me. Maybe not to you. You probably can't tell the difference being a one-to-one -one recipe. It becomes more apparent when you start watering your base down. This is when the brisket makes all the difference. It adds more richness to the broth. In other words, it makes it taste better. But best of all, you've got an extra topping when you come to serve your bowl. Now, if you want to see a full tutorial on how to properly prepare the brisket, it's linked in the top info card above. The final stage of seasoning, adding in the X Factor. Now, leading into this stage, we know the broth is slightly salty because we've deliberately added more fish sauce than we needed. Our job here is to balance out the taste with a bit of a twist. And for today's example, I'm using oxtail concentrate straight from my pressure cooker. So all I did was, uh, during the week, I cooked some oxtail with water, which turns it into a solid jelly packed full of flavor. I'm going to take this, adding it back into the broth to smooth out the rough edges. In order to understand this whole X Factor business and why it's so important to me and on this channel, it's a term that I coined to describe a taste in a broth which makes it more memorable, more special than others. And there've been very few that I've come across in my lifetime that have this. Most recently, filet in Ho Chi Minh City. I'll always remember that, bro, because it was just out of this world. Here we go. It's got the X Factor. In order to understand this for our recipe today, we need to go back to the beginning. The base for this recipe is 100% beef bones. It's linear. If I draw it on a graph, it's a straight line. It's boring, which is why I added oxtail concentrate. I use one cup or 250 mils enough to introduce a curve to the taste profile. So essentially what we're doing here is adding a unique spin on the broth by adding in this X factor. I know restaurants that add in chicken, pork bones, you know, you can add in the secret family ingredient that's been passed down from your great, great grandmother. This is when you add it in to give your broth its own unique identity. Although I recommend adding in the X Factor, you can choose to skip this altogether. If you do, simply reduce the amount of fish sauce during the final adjustment stage. Now, following the completion of your pho, I wanted to run through some quick tips. Number one, the finished product should be over seasoned. That is, it should taste slightly salty. You need to overshoot the runway, remembering the broth needs to maintain frame once you add in the noodles, the meat, the garnish, lemon, etc. So as you're tasting the broth during the finishing stage, especially if you're new, it can be deceiving. So resist the temptation to water it down just because it seems salty. See, the thing is, if you season on the money, by the time you add it to a fully loaded bowl, it's going to taste bland because each of the ingredients in the bowl weakens the taste of the broth. So remember, guys, tasting the broth on its own and in a completed bowl with the noodles and everything are two different things. So my best tip for you guys is, if in doubt, go make yourself a tiny bowl, bit of noodles, bit of meat, ladle the broth on top, taste it just as needed once you're happy with the taste of the broth I strain it through a sieve to a container ideally it would have guides along the side i use a chinois 
for those who have been asking, and I use a three liter measuring jug, which has made countless appearances in my other tutorials. And I just like using a jug because I know exactly what I finish up with. Being a three liter recipe, we start off with three liters of base. We want to end up with three liters of fur broth at the end. It's a one-to-one -one recipe. And if you find yourself at a 2.9 liters at the end, simply top it up with 100 mils of water to get it back up to three liters. The day I made this broth was Saturday afternoon. It was gorgeous weather, couldn't help myself. We ran across the road just to show you how beautiful this broth is in the afternoon sun. Straight after that, into Saturday night at dinner service. It was a very busy night. One of the first tables to walk in ordered two DB5s. I served them this broth I just finished. And they smashed it. The following day, took the broth out the back. I've got this shaded area, which I love because the lighting is just perfect. And again, I wanted to show you how beautiful this broth is in natural daylight. By the end, if you've made this correctly, you end up with a strong, complex broth, a subtle hint of spice on the back end. Now, in terms of taste, it's rich, beefy. That's its personality. And this is derived from natural sweetness from the bones. We spent countless hours stewing the bones, which releases natural sweetness. Vietnamese people call it Ngot Tu Sung. It's highly prized. It's something I want you to experience because the way I interpret seasoning for this recipe, I've deliberately pushed this natural sweetness to the forefront of your palate. And as soon as you taste it, it should be obvious that it's rich, it's beefy. And this level of sweetness is the opposite of most restaurants' interpretation of pho, where it's thin on bones, heavy on artificial sweetness from sugar, MSG, heavy on spices. And if you've never experienced this level of natural sweetness, it's a magical experience. How does my broth compare with the pho an? Do they taste exactly the same? Of course not. Two broths, two different personalities cooked by two different people. The pho an broth, if I also describe it, heavy on spices, especially the clove. But if we're talking depth of flavor and how much is packed into it, both broths side by side are near identical as shown by the similar bricks and salt reading. Although I mentioned earlier, resist the temptation to water the broth down, you may find the final product too strong. This is where you dial it back down with extra base or water to suit your own personal taste. Just make sure to write down your settings. To wrap up this video, what I've done is taken you to a destination. The view from up here, amazing. This recipe works, it's a starting point. What you do with this recipe and where you take it, the sky's the limit. You may be content sharing it with your immediate family, but for the dreamers out there, for the aspiring restaurateurs who dream of one day opening up a pho restaurant, let me tell you this, there's a huge market opportunity for good soups. And I hope this recipe inspires you to pursue those dreams. If you found this video useful, please do me a solid, a drop a like, a comment, a subscribe if you haven't already. Pinned in the top comment will be my new email address. Feel free to drop me an email, including your successful batches, any photos, where you're from, a short story, and I'll start sharing it here on the channel. I do apologize for the amount of time it's taken to put this video together. It was a struggle. And the reason it took so long, braces. But we got there in the end and that's all that matters. And even without uploads, the channel is still growing. So thank you so much for the love and support here on the channel and also at my store, which has been very, very busy. And to the family who left me this lovely note on one of the tables the other night, Dear Leighton, we love your YouTube channel. Thank you for the delicious pho. Best regards to Tangaho family in Melbourne. 
We've still got an entire chapter to go on how to create your bone broth base. So stick around for that. My name's Leighton. I'll see you in my next video, which I promise will be much shorter. Alrighty guys, welcome to the third and final chapter on how to correctly make the bone broth base for this recipe. I'm going to run through how I make it at the store and answer some frequently asked questions I've collated over the years on this topic like what type of beef bones to use, oven settings, temperature, and then at the end I'll talk about a very very common mistake people make which renders the base people have spent half a day on completely useless before we get into it i want to read out a comment as someone left on one of my previous videos where i was preaching on this topic of making a strong one-to-one -one base and i thought it was a brilliant comment this person wrote don't cheat the base when making fat it's the biggest sin restaurants commit watering down for more portions which means more profits at the expense of taste and the poor customer downstream who's paying the full price on the menu but they're getting half a bowl half the flavor half the nutrients from that broth is missing as we've discovered in the previous chapter the base is one part of the equation the seasoning the other Together, they go hand in hand to make this recipe work. You can't have one without the other. And to summarize the entire chapter very quickly, the aim is for you to produce a base with a bricks value of seven. The base consists of beef bones, water, heat, and time. Let's start with the basics. What type of beef bone to use? One of the most common questions I get asked on this channel, what type of bones do I use? Marrow bone. I use 100% marrow bones to produce my base. I'm gonna tell you a crazy story about a beef bone. It's going back like six years ago, long before I had this store. I drove an hour across town up to Ashgrove to a butcher called Meat at Billy's. It's like a high-end butcher. I brought this carton of expensive organic grass-fed beef bones because I thought it's gonna make my pho taste better. So after I cooked it, it made no difference to the taste. It still tasted like dog sh That's because I didn't know how to cook pho back then. I tried to get fancy. But my point is, when you're starting off, there's no need to spend money on expensive bones. Don't waste your time or money. Keep it simple, stick to marrow bones. It's readily available at most butchers. And I know everyone has their own different ratio of bones. Some people like to add in a neck bone or a bit of oxtail. That's entirely up to you. But the bulk of the base just needs to be marrow bones. The wrap up point here is use what's readily available to you locally. Luke, who I mentioned earlier, he used Cole's beef bone soup. That's all he had access to and he still pulled it off. So for those who are watching in a remote area that don't have access to a quality butcher, just use what's in front of you and don't get too hung up. Traditional versus oven. There are basically two ways to cook pho, with 99% of recipes out there following the traditional method, which is to parboil first. This is where you take the bones and dump it straight into boiling water to clean it. I don't like this method because it stinks, literally. Anyone who's done it will know exactly what I'm talking about. The second way to do it, which is what I've just shown you, is the oven method where we roast the bones first. I find this gives you much better results. The broth is more fragrant, which means you use less spices to mask out that yucky, beefy smell. But most importantly to me, you get a more visually pleasing result. The broth has a golden color hue, which looks way better than the sad grayish anemic color with the parboil method. My favorite part of making pho is creating the base. Why? Because most of the work's done passively in my sleep. 
apart from the initial prep and the finishing, 99% of the process is set, forget, and here's how I do it. Beef bones arrive in cartons, which go straight onto baking trays, roast until golden brown. This will largely depend on your oven at home. Everyone's situation will be different, so there's no point in me specifying my time and temperature on a commercial oven versus your 10 amp melee oven you've got in your rental, for example. My main piece of advice here is use your common sense. Once it develops a nice golden color and it's visually pleasing, that's when it's ready. And this may take you up to 30 minutes. From here, the bones go straight into boiling water. I quickly parboil it around three to five minutes. You don't need 10 plus minutes like the traditional method since we've roasted the bones first. You'll find very little impurities rise to the surface. Dump the water, wash the bones, fill it with fresh, clean water. Ideally, filtered water at a minimum. I use reverse osmosis at my store and there's a night and day difference between that and Brisbane's finest tap water. All right, guys, this is Noah's review of Brisbane's water. Five, no, four. From here, simmer low to medium heat. My exact settings, 92 degrees C for 24 hours, if you can. The workflow at the store, we do bone runs during a dinner service. So that by the time I walk out the door that night, Simply set the very cooker, go home, sleep, wake up the next day, come in, she's done. When you hear about people making passive income or making money in your sleep, same thing here. Because as I'm sleeping, the bone broth is maturing, the flavors intensifying, the bricks value increasing. And just a word of warning, if you intend on doing overnight cooking, never ever leave an open flame unattended. You can use an induction cooker or slow cooker to do this step safely. The amount of water you add depends on how much base you're creating. I always do big runs, and you should too. So if you're gonna drive down to Costco, you don't buy one potato, you buy an entire bag because you save more. If you're gonna burn time, gas, electricity, make it a big batch. But for today's example, let's keep things simple. Three kilos of beef bones, we wanna produce three liters of base. To compensate for evaporation, over such a long cooking period, add in 30% more water. So for three liters, you would put in 3.9 liters so that by the time it's done, it will have reduced to close to three liters. A few important points. The aim of this exercise is to lose as little as possible to evaporation. Now you achieve this through a combination of low and slow heat, plus the fat layer released from the bones is your best friend. It's like a cheap insurance policy. So do not be tempted to remove it too early. But I remember as a kid, mum would skim every bit of fat as soon as she saw it. So ever since my late grandfather died from a stroke due to high cholesterol, mum saw fat as the enemy. The temperature should be low and slow. You should not see any steam break the surface. If you do, temperature is too high. Having it on a roaring ball does not help. It does not speed up the process. If anything, it makes things worse. I explain this in my Coke can example in my previous tutorials, but we'll go through it again. So say the Coke from this can is what you want to end up at the end. It's a full formulation. That's what people thought they were creating, but they end up with this instead, a watered down Coke. How did this happen and why do so many people make this same mistake? The roaring fire. Half of the pot evaporates, they walk past, freak out, instinct reaction, top it up with water, repeat a few times, they end up with a weak, thin, watery base. It's compromised. Uh, this is a great example of what it should be. Tiny bubbles 
no steams breaking the surface. I started with this amount yesterday, 20 hours later, it's still the same. So that's the aim of the game, to lose as little as possible. Running through the finishing stage, once it's done, scoop out the bones, strain it into a container. Check your volume. This is crucial. So I highly recommend you strain it into some sort of container with measuring guides along the side. Be precise, guys. It's very important. Alternatively, if you have a pot that have the guides along the side already, use this instead. We're gonna go for a working example together now, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. So say you wanna produce three liters of base for this recipe. At the end of the cook, you end up with 2.7 liters. So slightly under, you top up 300 mils of water to get it back up to three liters. A bad example is if you somehow end up with 1.5 liters. You top up 1.5 liters to get it back up to three liters. Question, of the two, which is a stronger base? A, it's been watered down less. My wrap up point, if you chose sample B, continued on turning it into pho. The end result, it's a disappointing taste, all right? You cannot out season a bad base. On the other hand, if you created a strong concentrated base in a sample A, you almost guaranteed a great tasting bowl 10 times out of 10 because the bricks and the seasoning align.